Thank for the hospitality to Christina Grimpel, the CEO of Aufschlag of um, Kulturzentrum. Um, as far as I remember, Schlachthof has already a history of involvement with Documenta, and namely during the edition of Documenta, realized by, uh, curated by Roger Burgel and Ruth Noack, um, I remember seeing the the work of Artur Zmijewski and also the work of Hito Steyrl here, and it was my first um, encounter with uh, this institution. And then I realized what it, what it means for Kassel, and um, I got to know some, some people who are involved, and some of them are here with us, including Aisha Gulic, who is going to speak later, and who hopefully also is going to give us a hand and, um, and uh, um, an advice in uh, developing Documenta during the upcoming year and a half. Um, the occasion for our meeting tonight is the fact that we, after a um, long struggle, managed to publish this um, now first issue of the new um, iteration of the magazine uh, called South as a State of Mind. And South as a State of Mind um, is a magazine that already had a history when we arrived in Athens to start working on the exhibition in Athens and in Kassel, and the Documenta 14, which, as you may remember, has a working title, Learning from Athens. The magazine was founded by Marina Fokidis, um, and it, there were f five issues uh, published until we started conversations about possibly using this magazine um, as the magazine of, of Documenta. This idea came about out of the um, certain uh, unwillingness, uh, un unwillingness on our part to, to produce a new kind of magazine. We thought that it would be better to work uh, with an existing magazine that is already an institution in Athens of a kind. And we transformed it quite radically and we hope we um, came up with a with a magazine that is uh, as interesting as the one that Marina Fokidis has been um, producing um, over the last uh, couple of years in Athens. So there will be many speakers today who are going to tell you a little more about the content of the magazine and how it came about. Um, there are also some speakers who are um, going to be involved in the magazine in the future. Um, I also wanted to say that this um, South as a state of mind is not meant to be understood as um, a way to point to specific artworks or artists who are then going to be part of the Menda. There are artistic contributions in the magazine, such as uh, the work by Naim Moyamen and also uh, by Miriam Khan and some other works, as well as a good deal of poetry and fiction writing. But the magazine is more like a discursive playground for Documenta at this point, and there's going to be three more issues that we are going to publish in the run-up to Documenta in 2017. So in a way, since we are lacking an exhibition at the moment, we don't have anything. We are all professional curators um, who are unable to show um, art, and the photo magazine is in a way a substitute and, and a way to develop themes and also to present these themes to, to the readers uh, in advance of the uh, exhibition. <clears throat> I would like to uh, maybe now focus a little bit on one uh, tiny part of the uh, content of the first issue, which uh, has to do with an idea that came to my mind very early on in the process, and namely in the end of 2013 when I was appointed as um, artistic director of the comment, it was more or less coinciding with a time when a German magazine published some, um, some articles uh, regarding the then newly discovered um, um, collection of sorts. It's very often referred to as a collection, but I prefer uh, to use the term uh, estate or nachlass. And I'm talking about the so-called uh, 
Gurlit estate. And as you know, um, these works, around 1,500 works of art, were discovered during a police search uh, in an apartment that belonged to um, a German um, curator, collector, art dealer, uh, Hildebrand Gurlit. Uh, and these works were in possession to, um, uh, until 2013 of Cornelius Gurlit, the son of Hildebrand Gurlit. And um, they were discovered uh, owing to the fact that Cornelius Gurlit was found carrying a substantial amount of money in cash on the train that was traveling from Zurich to Munich and it was um, f for, uh, for the police it was a little bit uh, strange why this other gentleman was carrying so much cash with him although he carried a bit less than uh, what is allowed which is 10,000 euro I think when across the borders and as a result um, a s uh, police search ensued in an apartment in the Schwabing district of, uh, district of Munich where a large number of artworks were discovered and later on there were more artworks discovered in another location in a house near Salzburg where Cornelius Gruyt kept um, uh, a number of uh, works from, uh, from this, uh, well, that, that were at the time of his property. The works were confiscated and since then they were also researched um, originally uh, by an art historian uh, commissioned to do the job uh, sort of without informing the public that uh, such body of work is, is found and later on in a more official manner through the so-called task force that has been recently dissolved by the decision of the Minister of Culture <coughs> of Germany. So w when I got appointed as artistic director of Documenta this was the current b big news in the German press and media and I thought that we uh, need to take a position towards this uh, strange find. And uh, an idea came to my mind to uh, think of maybe including actually all of these works in the upcoming Documenta. And in the magazine you will find an interview which I conducted with uh, an American art historian, Alexander Albero, who has been dealing with in certain text that he wrote to the politics of memory in relation to uh, to art, as well as with Hans Hacke, who is not an unknown figure also to Kassel since he was um, participating in Documenta and his connection to Documenta actually dates back to um, Documenta 2, uh, where he served as a, as a sort of all-rounder assistant and when he also made a series of um, photographs that were then turned into kind of work of art showing the very early visitors to Documenta uh, posing in front of um, artworks on display. So Alexandra Albero, Hans Hack and another German artist Maria Eichhorn uh, participating participating in the conversation that is trying to see whether there is any relevance in the idea of including this rather um, dusty convolute of um, of artworks uh, as part of the contemporary art, art exhibition that Documenta is supposed to be. I think, as I said before on other occasions, that Documenta is not so much an exhibition dealing with contemporary art only today, but it's an exhibition that should address important uh, contemporary themes or subjects, and definitely the entire debate that uh, ensued uh, after it, the, the fact that, the, um, that these works were found uh, shows that this is a pertinent subject of Germany and perhaps it will be always a subject to which it is important to return. So um, I, I proposed um, to, to show these works and so far with little success and with little acceptance on the, on the part of the uh, German authorities and also on the part of the Kunstmuseum Bern that in the meantime has become uh, the sole uh, institution that is supposed to, uh, to receive the works from co the collection of uh, Hildebrand, from the estate of Hildebrand Gurlit. It's very easy to use the word collection, I'm trying not to do it, so it's the estate um, of Hildebrand Gurlit. Um, so, um, before his death, uh, the, um, the son of uh, Hildebrand Gurlit, Cornelius, wrote his last will, and in this last will he bequeathed all 
all the works to, to Kunst Museum Bern, except for those works whose provenance um, would be to uh, to be to be researched, or the works that are to be returned to the original owners. Um, in the meantime, not much happened. The works are still in the storage, and we are waiting for a decision of the court that is going to rule whether Cornelius Grulip was uh, fooling his senses when he was writing his last will. So the the, um, the court asked, I think, two psychiatrists to to, to produce a kind of um, a specialist paper that is trying to that will, that will decide whether Mr. Uh, Gurit was uh, capable of producing the last rule that should be executed. And uh, until then, and this decision is expected to come in January or February, um, nobody is really certain what is going to happen with, with the works. So we are still in Germany, the Christmas on Bern is waiting for their part. And in the meantime, we also learned again from the press that um, certain works are going to be probably uh, um, displayed in a special exhibition that, uh, on the initiative of the of the German Ministry of Culture, um, I suppose um, it is going to be organized at the Bundes- und Ausstellungshalle in Bonn, which is a state institution, as as you may know. Um, that was established very shortly after uh, after the unific uh, reunification of. Uh, of Germany and that somehow because of this reunification lost its relevance as a huge institution uh, because the capital was then moved to Berlin. So in Bonn uh, there is the Bundes- und Ausstellungshalle and this institution is now meant to organize an exhibition including the work, uh, the, the, the works um, or featuring the works if I may say so from from the estate of Gurlit. Um, I was um, so far. I've been avoiding commenting on this political idea of showing the works that are under suspicion in a state institution. But I think maybe at this point I would only say that uh, we should probably think of uh, certain historical instances when a state would reserve the right to, um, for instance, you know. Organize, deciding on how exhibitions should be organized and in which way the citizens should be confronted with heritage that is not always so pleasant to confront. So in this case, the state is taking the full responsibility for the manner of presentation. Of course, the presentation will be done with the hands uh, of, of the curators of that institution, but nevertheless, the state, in this case the German state, somehow cannot imagine that these works could go out of the hands of the state into the hands of curators like I and like my colleagues in the team of Documenta 14 who would be capable to work with meanings that this um, body of works generates uh, towards an exhibition that would be more, well, it would be probably less, um, so to say, bound to represent any one particular political idea uh, with regard to historical memory, including um, works of art or or other objects that were in, in the state of, of Gurlit. So um, we are in the moment of waiting and at the same time we are moving on with the designing the uh, in a, in a kind of display, architectural display for the exhibition. And we very much hope that um, we'll in this way move towards um, creating a, a context in which uh, the uh, inclusion of the Gurlit estate in the Comenta will only be um, natural and will come as a, as a fact in 2017. Um, so this, this much about um, the context of this conversation uh, that you may read in the printed version of, of the magazine, and I must say the magazine is in English. It is in English uh, only because it is uh, around, I think, 260 pages. So it's a lot of text and obviously adding one or two language versions to it was out of the question, but since we are living in the era of internet, we also have the in internet uh, version of the magazine on our website of Documenta 14 and there you can read, uh, I would say, the large majority of text translated into German and also for those Greek guests who are here um, in Greek. Um, 
Fine. There's one other um, piece of writing uh, in the magazine that indirectly, in our opinion as editors, was somehow presaging the, uh, the story or some motives in the history of, uh, of the girly estate. And this is a, a short story by a German writer, Stefan Zweig, which is called uh, Unsichtbare Sammlung, the Invisible Collection. And it's a story which, uh, by, by strange coincidence, also begins with a description of a train journey. And, uh, it's a journey that an art dealer undertakes in order to see a former client of his, a collector who is living in a smaller town in Germany. And this is during the Great Depression, and uh, there is not much uh, happening in the art market. So the dealer decides to visit his old friend and collector in order to once more see an amazing collection that, with help of that dealer, the collector gathered during the years preceding the Great Crisis. And I will not tell you the entire story, but it's really fascinating, and uh, I, I think it's... Uh, I assume it's not so well known, so it's always worth reading, because sometimes the stuff written during the Great Depression is strangely fitting um, for, for, for today. Um, thank you. So this is um, my contribution meant to encourage you to, to read into the magazine. As I said, it, this is only a tiny portion, a kind of snippet of what, what <coughs> constitutes uh, South as a State of Mind issue 6 for winter 2015. Uh, as you see, the cover is yellow. We can promise that uh, in subsequent issues, the cover will, will uh, take uh, you know, different uh, colors. So it's not a yellow magazine. <laughs> My wrong, Queen. Okay. So, uh, and in this way, I would like to uh, very casually introduce uh, the editor in chief of uh, the publications uh, for Documenta 14, uh, Quinn Latimer, sitting here to my left, second row, in this irregularly arranged space. It is arranged regularly because we kind of wanted to avoid, you know, uh, the typical situation of the panel, panel uh, that is sitting behind some kind of table and sort of preaching from, from the stage. And also the venue is tiny and we thought it may be more interesting when the speakers are scattered um, among the, uh, the visitors to, uh, to this lounge or event. So Queen Latimer is is an American poet and art critic and writer with whom I've worked before on numerous occasions. We produce uh, some publications together uh, during my time at Kunsthalle Basel. And um, South as a State of Mind is a first fruit of uh, our uh, so far successful and pleasant collaboration as co-editors of the magazine. Um, behind me, two rows behind me, sits Marina Fokidis, who, as I mentioned before, is a founding editor of the magazine uh, South as a State of Mind in Athens. And uh, Marina, apart from being the founding editor, is also the found founder of an institution called Kunsthalle Athena. There is a Kunsthalle in Athens. Um, and she's an um, eternally freelance curator in Athens, who uh, I think, to my knowledge, has never been involved with one institution except for the one that she founded herself, that was the Kunsthalle, except with the magazine that she founded herself. So this is the first time that Marina is involved with an institution, and it is Documenta 14, because Marina, on top of everything, is also the head of artistic office in Athens for Documenta 14, so she's somehow also on board um, in our team in a very different role. She's gonna be in charge of working with many artists who are going to be visited Athens and then um, Castle to make work for Documenta. Um, uh, called Frankfurt is <laughs> <laughs> uh, heading the publications program that is you know taking gargantuan proportions. I can see it looming already over us and Catherine is going to manage it all. And, and do it in the best best way. She has previously been already involved in, with Documenta, so the fact that you can still um, 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 read 
and, and looking to some some of the publications of, for instance, the previous documenta is mainly her her um, so to say uh, yes she was involved. 